you. So in the interest of time, I think we'll go and move forward. We have a bunch of members of our team here as well, so thanks for the Research Park team members. But I think I'm going to just pass it over um, to Shahar to talk a little bit about, uh, of course, our topic today, but also about what the Brand Hub is. And I am not going to claim to be an expert on what the Brand Hub is. Brand Hub is. That would be Susan here. So I know we're going to talk about that a little bit at the end, I believe. So in more depth about Brand Hub and what it does. So. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so welcome to Fahar. We look forward to hearing about uh, brand and marketing strategy for startups. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. Great to meet all of you. Um, and yeah, I'm good till about 12.50 and then Susan will pick up and tell you more about the Brand Hub, but uh, I'll, I'll introduce myself in just a moment. Um, as she mentioned, we've got brand and marketing strategy for startups. You know, initially this was just called marketing strategy for startups. But in my world, it's impossible to separate brand and marketing, which is why I feel it's important to talk about both. Um, so just a little about what I'm going to talk about today, and apologies, I'm, I often teach students, so sometimes I get into teacher mode, and sometimes I get into consultant mode. Um, and so you sometimes see my tone of voice change, depending on that. Um, but we're going to touch on brand strategy, and then marketing strategy. And you'll see how they're both built on the same elements, but they branch out in different ways. Those are both, I can't even call them a crash course, because I teach teach both of those subjects um, normally over the course of a semester, and now I'm going to try to cover each of those in about 10 minutes each. Um, the good news, though, is that at the end of this, I'll also share additional resources for you to check out um, on your own time, and I'm happy to chat with anybody further if you'd like to reach out. Um, after I talk about those two things, I'm going to uh, give you guys five tips for startups as it relates to brand and marketing, and they're things that uh, are helpful for any business, but in particular startups. You'll hear in a moment about how a lot of my experience is with startups. And then I'll do Q&A at the end for whatever time allows, but if you have questions along the way, please just chime in. I don't love to just hear myself talk all the time, um, and there's a decent chance I might say, hey, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But I love hearing questions. When I teach undergrads, I find that getting questions is like pulling teeth. It is so hard to just get them to ask. So please, if there's anything on your mind, uh, please jump in. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. Um, my background, actually I was a U of I student here. I graduated uh, with my undergrad over 20 years ago now um, and stuck around for a year to get my master's. Um, and then I went up, I, I majored in advertising. So I went up to Chicago and started my career in the ad world. Um, so I was a copywriter and then creative director and then a strategist. Those are just some different roles if you're not in that space. Um, but I spent much of my career just focused on brands and how they communicate themselves. Um, also, during that stretch in Chicago, I had a five-year stint owning an agency with a partner. Uh, the two of us worked well together at an agency. We went off and started our own. Um, we named it after ourselves, which I do not recommend doing, by the way. So um, I was glad to hear. I don't think anyone here did. Um, if you're already curious why, just let me know. And we did this for about five years, and we grew, and we were successful. But I found that the bigger we got, the less I liked my job. So I sold my half to my partner and went on to other things. Um, Bates Marone is still an agency that's thriving up in Chicago. Um, also then, after that, I came down here to teach. I was looking for a change of pace. Um, I had small children that I didn't get to see all that much since I was commuting in and out of Chicago every day. And um, so I came down here to teach basically the subjects that I uh, did professionally up there. So teaching, advertising, creative, strategy, things like that. Also, about five years ago, we launched the, um, the Masters of Strategic Brand Communication, which is an online master's program designed for uh, working professionals. So I both teach the intro course there and also I'm the academic director of that. And then on the side of that, one of the things I love about the teaching job is that it allows you the opportunity to branch out and do different things. I also continually consult uh, for clients, I have a partner that I work with. We're a virtual agency. It's just the two of us. We worked together before. Um, it's called Blue Green Branding. I bring it up again just because later on I'll share some links with you for more resources on like how to do brand architecture, how to do messaging, and things like that. Um, I only share this background so that you know where I'm coming from. Most of my experience is in industry, um, and then teaching is just an extension of that, whereas you know, sometimes I just need to uh, educate or share resources on how these things are done. Um, so I just want to dive right in, but again, if people have questions along the way, I'll pause sometimes, but please don't wait for me. Um, just go ahead and jump in if you'd like to. First thing I want to talk about is brand strategy. Brand is just one of those things that is kind of fuzzy and nebulous, and people are like, so what is a brand? Um, and if you ask the average person on the street, like if I ask my mother what's a brand, um, even though I've had this conversation with her many times, you know, they'll 
she'll think about the logo, right? She'll say, oh, you're, you know, McDonald's brand is like the, the golden arches, right? Or maybe Nike's brand is like, just do it. They'll usually, people will think of the surface level of what a brand is. And brands come to life in a lot of different ways, right? Um, but if you look up different definitions of brand, there's a lot out there. I'm not huge on definitions, by the way. I find, depending on who you talk to, they all have different definitions. Um, I, one of my favorite definitions of a brand is that a brand is a promise. Uh, it's a promise of expectation. When people hear about your business, they kind of know what to expect. Um, you know, if you're going to open a can of Coke, you have a sense for like what that experience is going to be like to drink it. If you walk into an Ikea, you have a sense for what that experience is going to be like to shop there. And that's what we do with brands. You know, it's your reputation, it's your image, it's all that wrapped in. I see people sometimes define a brand as like the soul of your business. It's what your business is known for. Um, it's, it's all those things wrapped together. Um, Brands are built of many, many elements. You know, often people start by thinking about their products, but you know, listening to everybody here talk about their different businesses, sometimes your product is somewhat intangible. You know, sometimes your business uh, offering is a service, or it's an area of expertise, or it's a platform. Um, so, you know, absolutely it can be that, but you know, it goes beyond that. It gets wrapped into things like your company culture. Um, it gets into things like your mission and your values. Those are some parts of it. Um, I'll talk about some of these elements in just a moment, but things like positioning and persona. That's like when you peel back the curtain and take a look at how brands are made. But brands then manifest in a million different ways, which is why uh, there's a lot of effort that's put into building brands. Because once you have that set, it can come to life and be holistic. I'm going to use that word holistic a few times today, but that's because when you look at a brand, look at it beyond just, you know, what is that one sentence I say about it? What's my logo? But is my brand delivering on that promise across the board? Um, this is my favorite thing about brands, though, uh, in terms of definitions. This, there's a book called The Brand Gap that I'm a big fan of. I make it require reading for my students. Um, I recommend it. It's actually a, it's a fun book. It's a short book. It's sort of like a, uh, an, air, I call it an airplane book because, you know, you pick it up at the airport, you read it on the plane, and by the time you land, you're done with it. It's a pretty quick read. Um, but in there, there's a lot of great basic things about brands, but this is my favorite definition here. They say, your brand is not what you say it is. It's what they say it is. They being your target audience, the public, the people who you care about, the people you're trying to communicate to. You exist in their mind, and they get to decide what to think about you. So the best thing you can do is try to shape that perception, be thoughtful about it, try to steer it where you can. But ultimately, the control is not in your hands, which is why it's so important that whatever you put out there in terms of your messages, um, your experiences, you need to make sure that your offering really backs that up in everything that you do. Um, one of the core elements of this is brand positioning. And I'm going to get a little bit jargony for you here because there's so many different terms that we strategists like to throw around um, and sometimes we're speaking a different language. Brand positioning is, in my opinion, the heart of brand strategy. It is trying to purposely decide what does my brand stand for. You all actually, when you introduced yourselves and you gave like, you know, the one to two sentence description of your business, you were already practicing brand positioning here. You're trying to say, this is what we're all about. Um, brand positioning is, again, it's the space that your brand occupies in the mind of your target audience. And that's compared to what else is out there. Brands don't exist in a vacuum. It's not like you can't say, well, we stand for quality and service. Okay, great. Well, maybe five other companies do that exact same thing. Maybe they do that even better than you. Um, or they just have more of a reputation for it than you do. So it's very important that you try to think about, what is my audience thinking about my brand? I'll talk about target audience in a little bit, but what do I know about them that I can then lean into and find out where does my brain exist in their world? We all know that everybody has a short attention spans. Um, brands have at most a few seconds to grab your attention out there in the world before you decide to pay attention or to move on to other things. And most brands, even really complicated ones, big global brands, um, they're still usually just known for like one thing. Um, and, you know, they have a reputation. If people were to describe them, they're like, oh yeah, they're the blank one. Um, or they're all about blank. Even though there's a lot more to them that you could unpack, even giant brands like, again, Apple, Nike, McDonald's, Disney, they usually have a way of summarizing what they're all about in a sentence, or in many cases, sometimes just one or two words. Um, when they do a good job at that, they then take that really simple thing and then they use that as a lens for everything that they do. So if they're working on developing advertising and marketing campaigns, they're like, okay, what's that one thing that we really want to communicate to people? Um, or if they're working on product development, they're thinking about, okay, the next product we have, we need to make sure it delivers on this because this is the one main thing that we want to know. 
Um, for example, you know, just the, the ones that are up there, you take something like Nike. You know, Nike is not positioned as, we make shoes, we make sports equipment. You know, they want to represent something more emotional, something that's more scalable. The idea of winning is something that really comes across there. Winning, sometimes meaning like be very competitive and perform well. Sometimes it's more about an internal challenge, like you want to stand for excellence within yourself. But this is why, you know, when they even branded themselves, naming themselves Nike, that's the Greek goddess of victory. You know, they were already thinking ahead. We could come up with a name that's like, you know, I think they started with shoes. What's a name that works for a shoe? They were going beyond that. These days, the example I like to give a lot is Tesla. You know, when they named Tesla, they weren't just thinking, what's a cool car brand name? They're like, we're in the business of energy. We need a brand that represents energy so that we can scale beyond that. Um, and then once you have a brand position, and I'll share later on resources for how do you find the one that's right for you. Many of you have already, uh, may have already done something like this. You then make sure that everything you communicate moving forward is focused on that one thing in, in one way or another. Um, there's other elements to brands though. You know, when it comes to brand strategy, what you're known for is just one part of it. There's also things like your mission and your values. And these are the types of things that are more about what do you stand for? What drives you? Um, these are the things that honestly, until about 15 years ago, most companies just kind of kept to themselves. You get a few brands that were maybe um, somewhat like philosophy driven, uh, but most of them were like, hey, our employees will get the handbook, it'll have our mission and values here, um, and that's about it. Then people learned, hey, sometimes our customers care about this sort of thing too. Um, let's go ahead and package it up and share that with others. And sometimes I think this works really well. Other times I'm like, you know what, you sell you know, minty gum, you really don't have to stand for something really huge. Um, but most brands have some aspect that, that defines what they're all about. Um, there, was a, um, there was a TED talk by a guy named Simon Sinek a long time ago, um, who's now famous for this sort of thing, the idea of start with why. So, you know, in his world, he says you should always start with why when you're describing what your business is all about. I would argue you don't always start with why. A lot of times your business did not, you know, sprout from that. But it is good to think about your why. Why do we do this? Why do we exist in the marketplace? And then make sure that that's tied together with what it is that you're known for. Um, and then some brands like Tom's Shoes or, you know, there's plenty of other options out there. Even their business model is driven by their why. Like every time you buy a pair of shoes, we also give a pair of shoes to someone across the world who really needs them. Um, other times it ends up being just, you know, a plaque on their wall. Um, sometimes it ends up just working its way into brand guidelines. But besides just, you know, defining what it is that you're all about, also helps to think about why do we do what we do. Uh, there's other aspects of brands. Uh, brand strategies also involve brand persona or brand personality. This is kind of fun. This is you know less about what's that one thing we're known for. It's more like what's our vibe? You know, what's our personality like? Is our brand very friendly and conversational? Is it very like nurturing and warm? Is it kind of edgy and witty? These are the kind of things that brands, when they're smart, they, they set it ahead of time uh, to make sure then when they start communicating, it's getting that tone of voice across. So whereas brand positioning is what's that thing you're focused on that you're communicating, um, the brand persona is more how are you communicating? What's the tone of voice that you have? This is very important because there's a lot of brands that, um, you know, they say this is what we're all about. You know, I actually have a consulting client right now that's in the medical technology space. And, you know, they can't say we represent, you know, safety, security, efficacy, all that kind of stuff, and then say, hey, we've got a social media intern who's with us for the summer. Go write whatever you want on social media. And then, I mean, I've had a lot of these students. They go write whatever they want. They decide to have a sense of humor all of a sudden, and it doesn't quite jive. So you want to make sure the voice you put out there is consistent and purposeful when you do that. I don't throw all these different terms at you because I need you to like write them all down or, or, or um, memorize them or anything, but it's something to think about when I share tools later on to think about for your own branch. Have we defined what's that thing that we're known for or we want to be known for in the mind of consumers um, compared to competitors? Do we have our brand voice defined? And if not, is there a way that we can you know, workshop that sort of thing? Do we have our mission and vi uh, vision values defined or is that the kind of thing we want to retroactively work out? But these are all elements that brands don't always have, especially in a startup. You don't always have it right off the bat. But it's a good idea to get that foundation set before you start scaling up, before you start getting a lot of employees, before you multiply your communications. If you're brand new as a startup, you know, a year from now, you could, you could have a multiple of 10 uh, in terms of communications you put out there. So better to get all this stuff figured out sooner rather than later. I'm just going to pause right there. Does anybody have any questions so far? You know, I'm throwing a lot at you quickly. All right. 
Um, these things come together in a lot of different ways. I don't expect you to read this slide that's up here, but you know, in my experience as a consultant and also as a teacher, um, shaping brands involves putting it together in a way that's quick and easy to reference. And sometimes this is like, here's the you know 30 page brand guidelines that we have, and I you know or 100 page brand guidelines, and I've certainly worked on those. And those are usually like 80 percent visual brand guidelines, like here's logo usage, colors, etc. But there's also elements like positioning, persona, mission, all those types of things on there. Um, sometimes message maps. I'll talk about some of this stuff later. Um, in my experience, the brand blueprints can be one page. Often I challenge people to try to get it down to one page. And uh, later on, I'll talk about how strategy is the art of reduction, not, not expansion. But um, just know, depending on you know, models that you like, do we want the one-page version of this? Do we want the five-page version of this? Um, there's no right or wrong answer. The important thing is just to get people on the same page and get them aligned on what you stand for. OK, so the brand strategy, I just you know, have as almost a precursor for the marketing strategy, which I imagine is why a lot of you are here today. So marketing strategy is, you know, once you have that brand, how are you putting yourself out there in the world um, in order to achieve your goals? Lots of different ways to discuss this sort of thing. I'm just going to scratch the surface. Um, but if definitely, if you came today wanting to talk about a specific area, please let me know, and we can certainly dive deeper into it. Um, marketing strategy always begins with goals. What it is, is that you're trying to achieve. Um, in our world of brand communications, those goals usually involve some sort of either a change in attitude or a change in behavior. Either it's like people used to think this about us, and now we want them to think that, or more commonly, people used to not know that we exist, and now they know that we do. Um, sometimes you're trying to drive them at, to action. They used to you know, buy a competitor, and now we want them to buy us. Or they used to do this action, and now we want them to do that. Um, this is important to note, because there are certain goals that marketing cannot achieve. Um, there's some times that I've had clients where they're like, we want to increase our profit margins. I'm like, I can't control how you manufacture your product. I don't know how much you pay your employees. That's outside of my ability. What I can do is help drive demand. So if, I, if we can get people to feel that this brand is or product is worth more, that's the most that we can do from our end. Then how much you choose to charge for it or make it for, that part is up to you. But it's always really important to get goals defined pretty clearly before you go starting to do marketing. Otherwise, it's kind of a shotgun approach. You're just throwing money into the winds, just hoping that it lands somewhere. Um, Everything in advertising, branding, marketing, all those worlds, it always begins with your target audience. I sometimes tell my students that we are in the business of persuasion, right? That's what we do. Sometimes we entertain, sometimes we inform. Usually people hire us to persuade somebody. And that means you need to really understand your target audience. If you have a background in sales, you probably already do this naturally, right? You want to get to know who it is you're talking to um, and know as much as possible about them. And in our field, there's you know, different ways that people break this down. Um, they include common things like demographics, which are you know, where do they live, what's their age, sex, income, nationality. You don't always have all of this defined. It's not always all important. But usually there's a couple of these points that are relevant. Far more important, though, are psychographics. This is what does our audience care about? This is more like trying to get inside your audience's head. And this is where you start getting into things that are harder to pin down, things like what are their tastes or hobbies? Do they have any goals or hopes or fears that they're trying to um, overcome or address? What is their experience with your brand? Do they know your brand exists? Do they have an opinion of it? Um, are you trying to get new people in that never heard of you? Are you trying to you know, convert people that know you exist but aren't interested in buying? Are you even trying to change somebody's mind? Like maybe they have a preconceived notion about you and you want to change that sort of thing. And along the way, it's sometimes also helpful to know things like what media do they consume? Um, what other brands do they like and buy, that can help inform your uh, decisions later on. Things like this are very important because, um, and this is an important thing to note with target audience, your target audience is not your entire audience. Most clients I work with, if I say, and, and my class always works with uh, local nonprofits, um, the client always says, our audience is everyone, right? You know, we're trying to get donations for our charity, so of course, we welcome money from anybody. That's not what a target audience is. A target audience is, What's a specific subset of our audience that we're trying to focus on? Those are the ones that we are spending money to try to reach. Those are the ones that we are shaping our messaging to address what they care about very specifically. But what you want to do with target audience is start to narrow things down. Who, what's the low-hanging fruit? If you're a startup, it's like, we've got to get X sales by X date or else we're sunk. So who are the people most likely to get us first? Or are we going after an audience that's more like an influencer audience? If we can get these people, they can convince those other people. 
Um, or is this more of like a long-term play? There's lots of ways to look at it. It's just a matter of prioritizing. Do you have a primary audience? Do you have secondary audiences? Whatever it happens to be, you want to start learning about these people that you want to persuade. If you really know the person that you're trying to persuade, um, and you can get in their head and you genuinely know what they care about, usually which comes from talking to them and doing some research, you are halfway towards persuading them. If you do not do this step, then everything you do moving forward is just guesswork, and you want to eliminate that whenever possible. Um, all kinds of ways that once you understand your target audience, you can address them. And I'm going to throw some models at you. These are not things that are um, you know, universal. These are things that are just different ways of looking at things. One way that, one way that I look at audiences is through a customer sales funnel, which is something in our industry we describe. You know, where is your customer in a pipeline? Um, and are we talking about reaching lots of people that are just a little bit engaged or a few people that are very engaged? And we, we think of it like a funnel because in your world right now, there may be, may be a mass of people that don't even know you exist um, and may barely even be in your audience. But if you were to reach the right ones and they were aware you exist, okay, now we can start to reach those people multiple times. Now we can go from just they know we exist to we're part of their consideration set so that when the time comes they're making decisions, we are part of the mix. For some cases, they're already on that short list, and we want to be the one that they actually go ahead and buy. Or lots of times, we're going after target audiences who already like and buy us, and we want them to keep coming back for more. Or the holy grail is um, at the bottom of the funnel is advocacy. We want to turn them into our brand ambassadors just because they're such big fans. They're going to start you know, sharing our content on social or recommending us to other people just based on the fact that they really like us, um, sometimes because also you incentivize that. So thinking about your audience, not just in terms of what are they like, but also where are they in this process, that helps people make choices like what kind of a medium do I want to use? If it's more of an awareness play, it tends to be more mass media. Let's just say that you were trying to reach um, people in a certain geographic area. You know, you might look at radio ads, you might look at um, billboards, or if you're going digital, you might do it by zip code or things like that. Whereas if um, if it's further down the funnel, you might have more information. It's like, okay, now we're looking for people who perhaps even have already bought from us. We can use much more targeted tactics in order to reach them. Usually as you work down the funnel, you get more and more targeted with your approach. This comes to life in a million different ways. These are just different customer sales funnels that exist online. Um, I share these to kind of show that there's no one right way of doing it. You may already have a sales team or a sales process where you've got your own funnel. Uh, just know that I, I kind of like the one in the bottom middle the best. It's not always a linear process. We like to think that it's like, okay, they didn't know exist, but now they do, and now they like us, and now they buy from us. It doesn't always work like that. Um, people go through all kinds of circles. Um, I remember working on a client that involved car shopping, and they you know, they had this big old swirl. In the car shop, we you know, consume certain information, but then once we start getting in car shopping mode, we start to gather that info, we search this, we come back, we go to a dealership, we come back, we talk to someone. So just recognize that people, when they're going through a process, trying to know, uh, trying to buy you, learn more about you, know that they're probably somewhere in here. And if you recognize where they're at, you can do a better job of reaching out to them the information that they're looking for. This also comes into play quite a bit when it comes to digital marketing. Um, you know, if you want to know what search terms people are looking for, you know, you can do research on that and make sure that your web content is reflecting that you have better SEO. Um, or if you're looking for some more paid uh, advertising, you can make sure that you're on the right platforms. Um, just in my experience, these things get mapped out quite a bit. You know, I'm going to talk about maps later on, but maps are just another way of saying visualizing your thinking. Things like marketing and branding, um, it's still human beings that work on these things, that look at these things, that have to use these things. And people have a hard time looking at a Word doc that's just in a whole bunch of bullet points. People like to see visuals. They like to get a sense for, okay, how are we approaching this sort of thing? Depending on clients that I've worked with, um, if you're talking about you know, marketing plans, there's usually a map where the uh, x-axis is time. You know, let's say like each, each column represents a month. And then you know, the rows often represent, sometimes they represent different tactics that you're working on. Other times the rows represent different audiences that you're trying to reach. Um, the, the example on the bottom there is like, that's one where it's like, we have six different audiences we're trying to reach, not all equally important, um, but what are some tactics we're doing to reach each of them to make sure that they're all addressed? And this is a good way to make sure that people recognize, oh, you know, we have a gap right here. We have an audience we've determined is important, but we're not doing anything to go after that. 
Um, or we're seeing that there's a big wave of stuff happening in March. Let's make sure that we get ready starting in January so that we know that it's all coming. But understanding how all these things fit together, it helps you plan what other tactics should we have as part of the mix. And it always comes back to your goals. What is it that we're trying to achieve? If we're trying to drive web traffic, social engagement, sales, reference referrals, whatever it happens to be, first define those things, then start to populate it. There's then a million ways to come up with ideas for things, which I'm always happy to talk about. But again, it always starts with goals and audiences. Um, then if you actually know that stuff, you are more than halfway towards persuading them of whatever you want to persuade them. There's lots of ways that this comes together. Um, some people like to uh, put together audience um, profiles or personas, whatever you want to call them. Things like this where you're like, okay, our, our target is Analyst Allen. This was actually for that medical healthcare um, technology uh, a client I'm working on right now. You know, what are a few things we can say about their pain points, their titles, how they find us, what questions they ask, things like that. People like to package these things up so that later on when they're making decisions on like, should we go ahead and spend money on this? Should we craft our ad to look like that? They can say, okay, would analyst Allen like something like this? Would this be a way we could contact him? Um, and the way that you get this information is you ask, you look, you listen. Um, some people do this quite a bit. Others need to be prompted. Um, but a lot of experience with interviewing people, this is where sometimes we really want quantitative information, and it's great if you have access to that. Um, I'll be honest, a lot of times startups don't have the time or resources for that, and I'm like, great, then just go interview five people in your target audience and collect you know, what they have in common. It's better than nothing. It's not, you know, um, it's not perfect, but it, it's good to at least hear from them. Almost every time you talk to somebody new in your audience, you're gonna get some insights and things you can do with that. So always encourage people to talk with their audience. Um, and by the way, that can include people that don't know you exist. It could also be like, let's talk to our best customers. We want more people like so-and-so. Um, let's find out what they're all about and how we get more people like that. Um, tip number two, align your team. It is very easy for a startup to be the vision of the founder, and then there's a gap between that and everybody else on the team. When in certain situations, that might be okay. Um, if you're building something that you want to last and you want to grow and you want to get more people on board, you want them to share your vision. You want them to be on the same page about, yes, this is our main message. This is the voice that we're going for and things like that. There's all kinds of different ways to get your team aligned. Um, I find the best way is to just invite them into the creation process. Now there's tricks to this. There's a lot of times where it's like, hey, I'm a founder and I don't want this to be a democratic process. That's fine. It doesn't have to be a democratic process. I kind of like to use more, I think of it like an enlightened dictatorship, right? You call all the shots. It's, you're still, if you're smart, you want to bring in other people so that they are feeling it, they share their input, and then in the end, they feel like they, they played a role in creating it. And if they were there in the room or on the Zoom when you were coming up with these things, they're more likely to buy into it later on uh, because they're not just being told, here's how it is. All right, tip number three, strategy equals focus. Focus is the most common word that I use when I talk about strategy. When people are in research mode, it's all about expansion and gathering lots and lots of information and being thorough. When you want to shift to strategy mode, that's when you stop expanding and you start contracting. It's all about how do I clear away the noise? How do I get this down from a 20-page report to a one-page blueprint? That is the only way that people can use something. If you get things down to one paragraph, one sentence, sometimes one word. Then once you get to that point, you can do a lot with it. Um, this is a scene from the movie Inception. I'd like to share. Anybody seen the movie Inception? By the way, I'm a big fan of this movie. But um, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Right? It's like a sci-fi thriller where people enter the minds and dreams of people, and you know, normally they're trying to steal information from their minds, but in this case, they're trying to plant an idea in someone's mind. And in this scene with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hardy, Leo is asking, "Is this even possible?" And Tom Hardy's character says, "Yes, but you need the simplest version of the idea, one that will grow naturally in the subject's mind." This is what branding and marketing is. You are planting your idea in someone else's mind. And the only way this works is if they think it was their idea all along. People will put up their defenses if they think you're trying to convince them of something. And they will tell you, I make all of my decisions purely rationally, right? Advertising doesn't work on me. And in advertising, I say, yeah, of course, right? It makes my job a lot easier if you believe that, so that's great. Um, but this is what I see you know, strategy being about. You find that one thing feel like you've got the right thing. It needs to be something that already matters to your audience. It's like judo, right? You take that and you just maneuver with it. You don't convince them to care about something they don't. Um, you just make them focus on that. And ideally, it's something emotional. And this is where most brands fail. Most brands are too chicken to pick one thing. 
Um, they're like, hey, you know what? We stand for these three things. Let's have one of those taglines and say, like, you know, fast, easy, affordable. Well, great. You can just guarantee that everyone's going to ignore you now, right? So there's no guarantee that your branding or marketing will work. Um, but if you spread yourself too thin, that's the way you guarantee that it's not going to work. And there's all kinds of ways that comes to life, different tools. But that's why when we talk about things like audience, we're talking about target audience. We're talking about ranking your audiences. Um, that graphic on the right is actually from like a messaging workshop. I did one this morning. I'm going to do another one later this afternoon. Um, it's an exercise of like, let's plot different key messages and find out which ones are the ones that have real potential. And through this exercise, the ones that work their way to the upper right um, are the ones that have real potential to become you know, your main message, your value proposition, what have you. But it's always about ranking things. It's always about prioritizing things. It's always about clearing away the noise. Um, tip four, map it out. This is what I was talking about earlier with visualizing your thinking. It is very easy to pull together a report with lots and lots of bullet points. I have a background as a writer, and I'm here to tell you the less you write, the more people read. If you just put a bunch of text out there, people aren't going to read it. But if you visualize it, um, then people can kind of grasp it. It's like, hey, if I'm trying to say there's a main message and then there's three support messages with proof points underneath each of them, what you're looking at here is called a message map. And a tool like this is the kind of thing that later on um, can inform the 30-second you know, elevator pitch that you've got or the really in-depth website that you have um, because these things can flex in different ways. Um, also, you know, positioning maps. There's a lot of maps um, in my world. There's a lot of times you're like, okay, let's plot you know, your brand against the competitors. We've determined that these are the two main criteria where we win. So if that's the case, we would work our way to the upper right because only we deliver on those two. Where do all of our competitors line up? If we have it right, now we can have like the one sentence of what our brand is all about. And then the next time you go introduce yourselves around the room, you know what that one sentence is going to be about. Uh, mapping also just involves things like if you're in the media planning space, not just mapping things out on a calendar, like what are all of our tactics and where are we spending our money, but then going down to the ground level and saying, from the point of view of our target audience, what are they going to see from us? What are they going to see first, second, third? What are we going to drive them to? What are they going to do next? Um, from what I was hearing, uh, what you guys are talking about, a lot of your businesses aren't a one-and-done kind of a thing. People don't necessarily just click and buy something. It's a multi-step process where they learn more. So, you know, what are the what are the five ways we're going to grab their attention, hoping we drive them to our website so they can watch the video, so they can set up a tutorial, so then they can buy from us. Um, so again, when people map these things out, they can see where they're strong and the weak points are. Um, and then my last tip is to just build your toolbox. The good news is you don't have to do all this stuff from scratch. These things exist out there already, things that can help people um, do these things. A lot of times they're different platforms or exercises or what have you. Um, there's things on here that I, you know, I teach my students, other things that I share with my consulting clients. There are tools and maps for finding that one brand position, um, determining your brand persona and making sure people are aligned with it. Um, things like brand architecture in the bottom right, you know, do we have one company brand and then all of our products have their own brands? Or are all the products laddering up to our company brands? You know, are we like Nintendo where they have, you know, the Nintendo and the Super Nintendo and the Wii and the Switch and everyone has its own uh, brand? Or are we PlayStation 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Well, PlayStation is the brand. Um, and then, you know, the different items uh, underneath that are just the next iteration. So these tools are out there. Um, and this isn't even a plug because these are all free things, but um, I've been spending the past couple of years with my partner for Blue Green Branding collecting the most common things that people ask for. And so there's free templates and resources and articles on there about how to do things like messaging um, and, um, and positioning and persona and architecture and all those types of things. So, you know, because our time is short, I encourage you to check those things out and uh, just reach out to me if you have any questions on on that note, we are almost at time, um, but I know I went quickly. I hope this was helpful. And I just want to see, that, does anybody have any questions at all? I think i got a couple of minutes. Yes? Uh, I think that you already went over there. But uh, uh, about the emotional part of the branding and the marketing. So for example, in our case, emotion and tears is a big, uh, but sometimes it's difficult to as you said, when we brand or when uh, marketing, it, well, this is easy, it costs us. So could you uh, give us a, a, some tip to how to choose between uh, sometimes the emotional part, maybe it's more worth it than it's saving money. Yeah. But how to, how, to, how to convey this message or this part of the emotional part? Yeah, great question. So, you know, going back to one of these, uh, where did that go? 
Good. So that message map exercise usually involves like, let's, let's map some features, but also some benefits. And we're gonna map them on axes of where the x-axis is, how much does our audience care? Um, and the y-axis is how good are we or unique are we compared to our competitors? And a lot of times it's apples and oranges. It's like, in this case, it's here's a specific feature that we offer that nobody else does. Other times it's like, peace of mind. You know, what does that mean? But normally through an exercise like this, you can start to arrive at like, okay, what is the key benefit? I'm just gonna use peace of mind as an example. Lots of big decisions around technology, um, healthcare, education. These are things where people don't want to make the wrong choice. And so how do people feel peace of mind? Well, it depends on the person. Some people like to read reviews from others like them. Others want to know that you rank high on certain lists. Um, some people want testimonials. Um, but once you determine you know, what that benefit is, it can come to life in different ways. It usually does involve a collaborative process. And if you do have an emotional benefit, usually emotional benefits are the best way to lead you have to immediately back it up with some substantial, logical, rational points. Otherwise, it's just flawed. So that, that's the short answer for it. Yeah, great question. Uh, yes? Hey, I wonder if any thoughts on the, how uh, if any barriers in sales, sales and marketing, and if you had any thoughts on good ways to avoid kind of impasses, because too, like, we need content to go sell, Yeah, good question. So sales and marketing, um, it's funny because like most of my career I've worked with a director of sales and marketing who normally came from one of those sides but now oversees the whole thing and the other half like they don't get me at all. Um, the important thing honestly is I would say go back to brand. One of the best things that's happening right now in the industry is people are getting back to making it all about the brand, which in my opinion means getting back to the audience. If you can, what you have in common is you're all going back to we're trying to treat the same audience and get the attention of the same audience. If we agree on what that person cares about, now we can talk about how we can each help. We can make the messages and the tools, they give it like air coverage, you can be like the front lines people that go talk to them, but we should be speaking as one voice. We should have the same lead message. And we should have enough flexibility in our strategy that it can adapt to different media, to different audiences. You know, sometimes it's like, this audience cares a lot about that message, but not at all about the other one. Um, and that's why I always tell people, whatever frameworks you come up with for strategy, Build in that flexibility so that even if there's some of those non-negotiables, like we always lead with this message, the rest of it can be flexed. Of like, you know what, when I meet with this audience, I'm gonna lead with this. When I'm gonna do run an ad for this audience, I'm gonna lead with that. Um, as long as people know they share the same goals, they can be okay. I totally get it though. A lot of times they're not each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, a lot of times the founder is the best person to, to sell the company. It depends on the nature of your business. If you're going after more like relationship-based clients as your as your customer, um, the, the founder often is the best one to do that. They're often also going after investors at the same time with a comparable message. Um, then a lot of times someone hires a new business development person, and then they start like, why do, I, why do we keep going through these new business dev people? Like, they can't, you can't get them to stay. They're not doing the job. Well, because they're not the founder. So the sooner you can impart the knowledge and the passion of the founder onto that person, the sooner they can do their job. If, you're, if your field involves a lot of legwork, like we need someone to just continually reach out to people all the time, totally understand that sometimes you need a team of salespeople that aren't yet caught up. Give them quick tools. Give them like a cheat sheet, right? Here's the bullet points. I'm not gonna give you a script, but here's the main things that you really need to hit on, and here's a couple of ways to handle things, um, you know, objections and things like that. Um, try to scale up though. As an owner, you will, you will always run out of time. Every day I go to bed, having let a bunch of people down, you know, and I have a bunch of things on my to-do list that I never got to. As a founder, that always happens. You just want it as soon as possible, impart what you know and empower other people to do it. I think I have to get going, um, but I hope this has been helpful. Has this been helpful? Yeah. All right, good. So, um, yeah, and like I noted, if you have any questions for me, I don't know if this document's being shared with the rest of the team but uh, or with everybody, but if it is, uh, at the very end, you've got my email address right there. I'd love to hear from you. Um, a lot of my specialty is in technology and healthcare, um, you know, B2B branding in particular, so um, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for uh, joining today. Thank you, Shabar. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, I, I'm always uh, fascinated by what you have to say. So, um, I'm Sue Mehrman, and uh, I'm the Associate Director of the Brand Hub at the University of Illinois. 
Uh, we are a relatively new center. Um, we just began last year with an investment for growth project on the provost office. And we work very closely with uh, the Department of Advertising, um, the Small Center for Design and the Technology Services at Illinois. We are housed in the College of Media. Um, thank you, Vernon. I have a few slides, but I know that um, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to uh, distribute these to uh, Kathy so you can uh, have a closer look later. Uh, so really, uh, we began last year, and our focus is on, okay, our focus is on uh, connecting brands, innovators, students, faculty together. We're looking for uh, ways to engage with industry and give our students experiential learning opportunities so that they can uh, get real hands-on experience while also helping industry uh, promote their brands, services, and businesses. So this is our mission, and I'm, I'm going to kind of, for brevity's sake, I'm, I'm going to uh, kind of skip through some of this, but really, our, like I mentioned our mission, and we focus on fulfilling our mission in four uh, main ways. That is through uh, action-based learning, professional development, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and also uh, research and consulting. So how can this help you? Um, I'm going to skip to the final slides, um, just, and then maybe if I have time, I can go back. But what I wanted to um, focus on today is um, how we can serve you, how you can engage with us, how we can partner with you. OK, so again, we're trying to work with different target audiences, like Shahar mentioned. Sorry. Uh, as Shahar mentioned, we're trying to work with different target audiences, students, faculty, industry, and the community. So one thing I wanted to point out, um, the advertising department has a large, uh, talented, and motivated student pool with a, a, a broad range of skills. So um, we have students that are creatives, we have students that are writers, we have designers, we also have a CS Plus advertising major within the Department of Advertising. So we're also working with a lot of students who have experience with data analytics, web design, and ag tech software. So uh, that's me bragging about our students and how perhaps you would like to engage and work with them in the future and how they can serve you. So there's three ways to really engage with our students. And some of these are beyond the brand now, but I wanted to tell you about them, right? Because I think they could be helpful to you, a helpful resource. So the three ways are with students individually, as a group, uh, through a project uh, that's overseen by the social media lab, which was just created last year in the course of advertising, through an in-class project, or you can work with the brand hub, which is us, and we can help to put together a faculty-led or student-led team uh, through sponsor uh, brand or sponsor brand development project. So individually, you go this route if you're looking for interns, right? They can be unpaid, they can be paid, and they can help in a variety of ways. If you need a brand ambassador, if you just need help with uh, your social media strategy and management, bring on some of our advertising students uh, to help you. Uh, we, um, uh, they could be unpaid, paid, and there's also um, some students who want internship credit or course credit. So uh, typically it's one credit hour for 16 weeks, one semester, and uh, that usually uh, measures out to about 100 hours of service from your intern. Uh, students can work about 20 hours per week, and also uh, it's possible to hire students as research assistants, which we can help to uh, facilitate. Uh, and this gives you some information. If you want to post a job opportunity or an internship opportunity, you can email uh, media at career, uh, slash or dash career services at OMO.edu. Uh, the job will be posted on a handshake, and the College of Media's career services team will help to promote your job opportunity. Okay. Uh, group projects. So your project might be ideal um, to be done by a class, right, at no cost, and this would be an experiential opportunity for the students. So example, we have, uh, for example, we have CS Plus advertising courses, the classes if you need someone to help you uh, build a website, uh, create features for your website that uh, you don't have the time to build, 
uh, that would be um, a perfect class project. We have a media entrepreneurship courses, um, and perhaps that could be developing an app, right? Uh, also, so, so social influencer, do you want a social influencer or an ambassador for your company? Uh, perhaps you could do that out of a class project, or um, the Brain Hub is also um, starting to put together a brand ambassador program, uh, which we hope will launch this fall. Also, uh, Shahar is a professor in the Sandwich Capstone class, so usually those are typically nonprofits, but um, those uh, courses can help provide you with things like market research, uh, brand strategy, a marketing plan, uh, and that could be um, within the course. We also launched um, with the Brand Hub's Hub and with uh, the Department of Advertising's uh, partnership, we launched a social media lab last fall. Uh, so just this academic year. And the social media lab is uh, it's faculty led. A small group of students meet weekly. Some students receive credit, some don't. It's not just for advertising students, it's for students all across the campus. And the students basically take in work requests, and there's a ticketing system, and they go through that system and they uh, complete smaller and short-term projects, right? So creating a video for someone's website, uh, writing press releases, taking over social media accounts for a few weeks, boost engagement, those kind of things. And now the Brand Hub, right? I should have probably focused on us from the beginning, but I'm going to help you with these are these sites I think you should know. So uh, one way you can engage with the Brand Hub is through free or paid consultations. Uh, for example, we have a Building Your Brand series. Uh, we're partnering with the Champaign Public Library. That's um, usually every third Thursday of the month over lunch. Um, the CPO provides some snacks, and we bring faculty, we bring students, and uh, um, local businesses can register um, on the link on that slide. So it's basically an hour where we uh, separate into different tables, and we talk to you about different uh, things, addressing your needs, right? If your need is Oh, I really want to understand the analytics of my website to uh, see where the gaps are, what I'm doing well, what I can do better. Then we can focus that uh, time on talking about analytics, and we could focus on uh, brand strategy, that kind of thing. And then finally, uh, we're uh, uh, looking to uh, support uh, firms, tech firms, startups, nonprofits um, through sponsored projects. So these would be uh, faculty-led uh, teams, student teams, potentially more senior student teams, a diverse group, right? So you'd have your CS Plus advertising student along with your copywriter, along with your uh, brand strategist, right? It could be a small team. There would be uh, clearly defined deliverables over a longer period of time. This would be uh, an MOU or contract between the brand hub and uh, your company, let's say. And uh, it's similar to, if you've heard of it, the IBC, Illinois Business Consulting, um, and the East College of Business at New York. So deliverables, deliverables could include uh, market research, uh, brand strategy, web design, data analytics, that kind of thing. It's a, a small charge, uh, and it's really uh, money that's funneling through the brand hub that actually just kind of, for the most part, goes back up to uh, paying faculty for their time and students for their labor. As much as possible, we would like uh, to not endorse the free student labor model. We would like to pay students for their time, uh, even if it's a flat fee or a stipend um, at, the, at the eight weeks or a semester. So if you're interested in talking to us about the project, uh, there's a link on our website. Our website is brandhub.illinois.edu. And there's a link there where you can uh, click on sponsor a project. We would set up an initial meeting with you, an hour long um, Zoom call or in person call, to uh, talk with you, understand your needs, determine how we can best help you, um, what faculty we would bring in. We have the potential to bring in faculty from all over the university, it doesn't have to just be um, advertising faculty. And we would just talk to you about what we need, and we could scope out the project. So uh, we, we want to work with you uh, to help you uh, grow your, your companies and your businesses. A lot of times 
I feel like startups especially are just focused on operations and investors and that kind of thing. And there's not as much time um, to spend on marketing, right? But at the same time, it's so sorely needed to get your story out and to connect emotionally with people and to um, engage, right? It's, it's vital to the success of future success of your company. So um, this, is our, this are, uh, is our contact information. Mike Gow is our principal investigator. He's also the department head of the uh, Department of Advertising and the College of Media. This is my email address. Our website, uh, please reach out. If you have any questions now, I can answer them um, briefly. Or I can, I'm here, I don't have anywhere else to be. I can stick around. Uh, I just want to be mindful of the time. Thank you again for um, attending. And thanks again to Research Park for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Susan.